In the lecture today, I would like to talk about heart induction processes. It's an extension of what was discovered many, many years ago by Spayman and Mangold on the primary inducer. And what happens during embryonic development is that at each level of development, inductive interactions are taking place. I would like to talk about one group of inductive interactions, and in particular, some molecular studies as well as cell and biochemical studies that we've done to get at a mechanism of how heart induction might take place. And with that, uh, I'd like to talk about the animal system we started with, the Mexican axolotl Ambistema mexicanum. Axolotls are salamanders that are natives of central and southern Mexico, particularly abundant around the mountainous lake regions surrounding Mexico City, or at least they used to be. Now there are actually more in laboratories than there are in Mexico, given that they have almost gone to extinction. These are particularly well-suited animals for the laboratory. They remain aquatic throughout their lives. That's why they have these external gills. They reach a reproductive age while they're still larvae then, really, so they remain aquatic throughout their lives, lay large numbers of eggs, and are very easy to manipulate because development takes place totally outside of the body in a transparent jelly coat, and you can watch development from the cleavage of the first division to the time of hatching. The main reason that I chose to work on this animal model, however, certainly it, it related to those very good features of having an animal that is easy to raise in the laboratory and, and easy to manipulate, but also it carried a simple recessive mutation in which the heart formed but failed to beat. It was called the cardiac lethal mutation. And with that, in a given spawning, there are 25% of the offspring that will show the defect. If we look at normal and mutant siblings at an early stage, this is when the heartbeat normally initiates at stage 34, about a week after the egg has been laid and begins to divide. Here's a normal embryo, here's a mutant, and they're virtually identical in appearance. The only way you can tell the mutant is that the mutant lacks a beating heart, whereas the normal sibling have vigorously beating hearts with blood circulation that you can visualize through the gills. After another three weeks or so, a mutant is shorter in length than normal, has microcephaly, poorly developed gills, and shows ascites. All of these are secondary defects resulting from an absence of circulation. This was shown by Dr. Rufus R. Humphrey back in 1972 by linking a normal and a mutant sibling parabiotically joining their blood supplies so that the normal blood circulation would keep the mutant alive. And you can see that the mutant was able to grow basically into adulthood. Early in development, prior to the time that the heart beats, uh, and in the case of the mutant, the heart never initiates beating in the embryo, these tiny aquatic embryos are able to survive as long as they do because of simple diffusion of oxygen directly into the tissues. What this experiment demonstrated was that all of the other features of the body were normal except the heart failed to beat. It never did form a heart structure even in this advanced stage but sort of a vein-like structure that conveyed the blood from the normal circulation into the mutant circulation. If we look by electron microscopy at the hearts of normal and mutant siblings, it's pretty obvious why the mutant embryonic hearts fail to beat. Here's a normal heart, has well-organized sarcomeric myofibrils complete with A bands and I bands, Z lines, M lines, and so forth. If we look at the mutant cells, however, instead of these organized sarcomeric myofibrils, which are the machinery for cell contraction in the heart, you get instead these amorphous proteinaceous collections. There are remnants kind of of being normal. You can see the dense areas that perhaps are similar to the Z lines, the alpha actinin. You can see a few thick filaments, very few thin actin filaments like you see in these I bands. We also did a series of biochemical studies. This is just uh, one that we did where we did uh, SDS polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, analyzed the constituent contractile proteins in mutant, normal, and, uh, well, we had some chicken skeletal muscle myofibril controls. But basically, one of the surprising findings was if we looked at 
normals and mutants, we found what appeared to be a normal amount of actin in the mutant embryos, at least in these gels. Myosin heavy chain was also abundant in the mutants, not as much as normal, but uh, clearly a significant amount in alpha actinin. This happens to be a yolk platelet protein. Alpha actinin, we found, was also present in the mutants. A very important protein associated with the eye bands and with the thin filaments, closely linked to the thin filaments, tropomyosin, abundant in normal hearts, was virtually absent from the mutant specimens. And we were able to confirm that by using Western blots in which we uh, used antibodies against tropomyosin. Here's normal heart. You can see the tropomyosin. Mutant hearts, uh, there's nothing there to see. And this is a mouse control in this case showing a large amount of tropomyosin. But clearly, on the basis of the Western blots, it was evident that the mutant hearts were deficient in tropomyosin. We wondered really why this might be the case. Why, were the, why did the mutants fail? We clearly know that uh, one possibility would be that tropomyosin gene is deficient. We found, and I'm going to show you a little bit later, that that's really not the case. The other idea at that time was that perhaps there's some kind of an abnormal induction taking place. And so we looked at the possibility that it may be an abnormality in induction and that the anterior endoderm, which is a, an important heart inductor tissue, might be deficient in the mutant. This is a histological section through an embryo at stage 35, the heartbeat stage. Here's the anterior endoderm. Here's the heart tube now that would be extending out toward you in a tube. And you can see there's a close association between that anterior endoderm and the heart, this heart mesoderm. Here's the epidermis, the skin on the outside of the embryo. But uh, we wanted to do some experiments to see what would happen if we took anterior endoderm from a normal embryo and combined it with mutant heart tissue in an organ culture environment. And when this was done, initially we put the normal anterior endoderm in with the mutant hearts, and after 12 to 24 hours, the mutant hearts began to beat. And so there was a rescue phenomenon, and we then asked the question, is this something that requires contact or is there something secreted in that medium by the normal anterior endoderm that might be able to diffuse to the mutant hearts and cause those to beat? And so we did what are called conditioned medium experiments, common in embryological studies, where we took normal anterior endoderm, cultured those endoderm pieces for about 40 hours in some simple saline solution that was called Holtfreiter's solution. We then condition that medium. By definition, we conditioned that medium with the anterior endoderm, and we then took the anterior endoderm out and added the mutant hearts. And when we did that, we found that the conditioned medium rescued the mutant hearts in over half of the cases. We decided to try to do some further experiments to see if we could narrow down what that substance might be in that conditioned medium that was active. We boiled the conditioned medium, to our surprise, it still was able to correct the mutant defect. So it wasn't probably a complex protein because proteins you would think would be denatured by boiling. We did some various enzyme experiments. We found also, in this case, neuraminidase didn't uh, have any effect. Trypsin, kind of confirming the boiling studies, this breaks down proteins and, and again, there was a little bit of a reduction, but clearly there was still a rescue of many of the mutant hearts. The RNAase, however, ribonuclease that breaks down RNA, totally eliminated the activity, totally eliminated the rescue activity from that conditioned medium. holt Frater solution controls, this was simply the saline solution with nothing added, of course, did not show any rescue. I actually then did a reciprocal experiment. The enzymes had knocked out the RNA, and that had eliminated the rescue of the conditioned medium. We then extracted RNA from the normal anterior endoderm, added that to the mutant hearts, and that too rescued the mutant hearts. So by adding the RNA, we found that RNA was what was causing this rescue of the mutant heart defect. We then did some experiments in which we made artificial RNA. We took the conditioned medium, extracted the RNA, 
and did T4 DNA polymerase reaction, made it cDNA, and then we ligated this into a bacterium with a vector, and from that we derived clones. We cloned the bacteria, and we isolated the clones, and we took 200 clones randomly, linearized the DNA, and then we made synthetic RNA from that, and used this synthetic RNA to test for the rescue process. So we had eliminated basically any other contamination from the condition medium or from what we had done when we extracted the RNA, that it might be some other small factor attached to the RNA. And we did that by, in this case, having bacteria make that synthetic RNA for us. We took the clones, we isolated the clones, and we pooled the clones to make this synthetic RNA. started out with four groups of 50 clones, 200 clones, and we finally narrowed it down to a single clone, clone number four. When we sequenced that clone, we found this RNA sequence, and if we took this RNA sequence, added that to the mutant hearts, we indeed got a very significant rescue. In fact, in a dose-response set of experiments of mutant hearts in vitro, we found that this artificial RNA that was obviously the pure RNA could rescue at very small uh, concentrations, very low concentrations. We would get a significant amount of rescue in the mutant hearts. The antisense, there was some background rescue, but antisense RNA provided no rescue at all. And so we were able to show then that that particular sequence had the ability to turn non-muscle cells into vigorously contracting cardiac muscle cells. You, you may recall that I said there was a deficiency in tropomyosin in the mutant hearts, and so we started to use tropomyosin in mutant hearts as a marker for the differentiation. And here you can see a normal heart with no RNA added. If you happen to have some red-green glasses, you can see these in 3D, three dimensions, and it gives you a little more spectacular perspective of what these cells really look like. But let me just mention that if you've got any red-green glasses, and if you don't have any and want some, we'll, we'll send you some. But basically, uh, it shows that the myofibrils are forming here, these are all myofibrils now. This is in a normal heart with no RNA added. The myofibrils then are sort of piled on top of each other at the peripheries of these cells. These are all individual cells. And so you see a darker staining. But what it does is it, it shows you that the myofibrils form at the peripheries of the cells. And you can see that with, with the red-green glasses. And I would encourage you to get a pair and look at them. And like I say, if you... Uh, don't have any and, or can't get a hold of them, we'll be glad to send you some. The mutant heart, however, when stained in exactly the same way with no RNA, showed virtually no staining, and that confirms what we had seen when we did the SDS polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis examination of the constituent contractile proteins. If, however, we took mutant heart and added the myofibril-inducing RNA, the MIR, uh, as we call it, we find that after a short period of time, uh, this was about 48 hours, you start to get myofibrils forming in these mutant cardiac cells, and with continuing development, with longer incubation times, longer treatment in the RNA, these mutant hearts literally turn into normal hearts. These cells are filled with organized sarcomeric myofibrils capable of rigorous contractions, and so this RNA this RNA sequence that we have added to these cultures that are in Holtfreiter's solution. These are organ cultures now. They're whole hearts. Clearly rescued the defect. If we examine the mutant hearts ultrastructurally, if we look, uh, in other words, in the electron microscope, and we look at the mutant heart cells, we see this amorphous proteinaceous material again. Here's a nucleus and some of the cytoplasmic material with mitochondria. But here uh, is the amorphous proteinaceous material. We treat that with the RNA. You now find instead of the amorphous proteinaceous collections, you get large numbers of well-developed, normally appearing 
organized sarcomeric myofibrils. There are still perhaps some remnants of being mutants. Uh, there are some lipid droplets and lytic bodies and, and some amorphous materials, but most of this has turned now into myofibrils, and the longer you leave it in culture, the more prominent those myofibrils become and the more normal appearing these heart cells become. Well, we wanted to learn a little bit more about the induction, and so let me, let me talk a little bit more about whether the MIR might be in the inductive heart tissue. That was the next question we wanted to try to answer. Was that MIR something that just happened by chance, or was it something that could be found in the embryo in the appropriate tissues that are involved in heart induction? This shows a cross-section of an embryo at, a, at stage 15. Stage 15 is when heart induction first takes place. Here's the neural tube, notochord, myotomic material. Here we get the endoderm. And down here is the precardiac mesoderm that's migrating down to the region of the anterior endoderm. And on the outside is the ectoderm epidermis. So we got the three germ layers right here. And we can look over here, the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. This is the precardiac mesoderm right down in here. The endoderm has been shown by earlier workers to be a potent heart inductor tissue. It was shown by Jacobson and Duncan back in the late 1960s, 1968. They published a paper. They're from the University of Texas showing that anterior endoderm, which this is, would influence or induce mesoderm to form into cardiac tissue. And the experiment that showed that uh, basically was if you remove this endoderm from the mesoderm, you take it off prior to stage 15, the mesoderm will not form into cardiac tissue. If, however, you leave the endoderm intact and leave it in contact with the mesoderm, the mesoderm will form heart tissue, and if you leave it beyond stage 15 and take it away, the mesoderm will still form heart tissue because that mesoderm has been determined. It has already been determined now that it will differentiate into cardiac tissue. Here you, this simply shows the direction of growth of that precardiac mesoderm that will come down eventually. It's coming down on both sides, actually. It will fuse in the midline and form a heart right down in this area, receiving inductive influences all the time as it's migrating down along this endodermal area. By stage 35, the heartbeat stage, 34, 35, uh, you can see that the heart tube is formed. Here it is. Here's the heart. It's formed into a tube now. Here's the ventral aspect of the embryo. Here's the epidermis or skin. Here's that endoderm, the gut. And you can see that the gut or anterior endoderm still maintains contact with that heart, even at the heartbeat stage. And it appears that inductive influences are continuing even to this stage. Well, what we wanted to do was to see whether we could show the presence of myofibril-inducing RNA, the MIR, in these embryos. And so we did in situ hybridization for the RNA in which we took antisense RNA, put a tag on it, and then we stained the embryo. Here's the ventral part of the embryo where the heart would be forming now. Here's the mesoderm. It's not as well fixed in this case because this is paraffin embedded material. And here you can see the presence of the endoderm here, the precardiac mesoderm here, and the epidermis here. You can see that a blue coloration is there indicating the presence of the MIR within this in situ probe. If we use controls, of course, either no probe or an, a sense probe, you get no staining. So this confirmed the presence of the MIR in the normal embryos. Now we wanted to look at mutants, but of course this is stage 15 and we can't tell a mutant from a normal until the heartbeat stage. That's the only way we can tell a mutant it fails to form a beating heart. And so we looked at the stage 34 normals and mutants and found that neither expressed this particular RNA at that point in time. It didn't express it that we could detect. 
And so uh, we really were not able to do that experiment at that time, and we had to come up with some other approaches that would uh, allow us to make these uh, kinds of analyses because clearly an obvious question is, do the mutants have MIR? The normals do. Well, since we weren't able to do this at the heartbeat stage because the normals didn't have the MIR either, we borrowed a method that was developed some 80 years ago in France by an individual by the name of Charlemagne. What Charlemagne had done was to produce chimeric salamanders. He would take pieces of salamanders, cut them apart, fuse them together, and, and he could show that they would survive and grow very well and, and grow into adults and so forth. And so with that in mind, we proposed to do and were able to accomplish using head-heart transplants onto mutant bodies. So we took a normal spawning in which 100% of the offspring are normal. We took a mutant spawning. Now this is a simple recessive mutation. So 25% of that spawning would be mutant. And we cut the head hard heart region off of the normal and transplanted it onto the body of a mutant. Now we didn't know at this point whether this was a mutant or a normal because three-fourths of this spawning would be normal. However, we kept the head heart region in a little culture dish and if that head heart region developed a beating heart we knew that this was actually going to be a normal body and that wasn't really what we were interested in. If however the heart failed to beat we knew that it was a mutant and we then would have the right combination of a normal head and heart, mutant body, mutant gonads, we could grow these to adulthood, mate them and a hundred percent of the offspring would be mutants. And indeed we were able to do this and we have some adults that are illustrated here. We happen to have used pigment mutants to, to make this point a little more clearly. Uh, here's a normal head and heart, mutant body, and this is the reciprocal kind of plant transplant, different uh, pair of animals, normal head and heart, uh, mutant body. And when we mated them, 100% of the offspring were then mutants. We published this, and if anybody's interested, we can uh, provide you with a reference for that. But this then allowed us to study mutant embryos from the time of the fertilization of uh, the egg and the initiation of the formation of the zygote onward. And we were then able to look at MIR expression at different stages and compare the normals with the mutants. And our expectation was that the mutants wouldn't have this MIR. Well... It turned out that was not the case. At stage 10, we didn't see much, but we didn't expect to see anything until stage 15. However, at stage 15, which is the heart induction stage, both normal and mutant embryos showed the MIR. And that continued up through stage 30, and once you get up to the stage uh, 34, 35, which, which is when you can tell the normal and mutant siblings apart, uh, basically the staining had stopped. So what we did then is we cloned the mutant genes as well, and we found this mutant sequence, and we found that there was a single point mutation, a G to T point mutation, between the normal and mutant gene, and that was the only difference that we observed in the segment of RNA that we were using in the rescue experiments. And so let's look at the functional deficiency and prove that indeed the mutant RNA is not capable of rescuing the mutant hearts. Here's tropomyosin staining in a normal heart, which is what you would expect. Tropomyosin staining in a mutant heart, very little staining. If, however, you treat the mutant heart with normal RNA, you get a rescue and you get a lot of tropomyosin and myofibrils. On the other hand, Treating the mutant heart with mutant RNA resulted in a non-rescue. And so that confirmed that the mutant RNA was incapable of rescuing and promoting cardiac differentiation in those non-muscle mutant heart cells. When we did a secondary structural analysis of the RNA from normal and mutant axolotl embryos, we found a significant difference in the secondary structure. Now, this was done by taking the sequence and sending it uh, via computer to the University of Moscow 
in Russia where they have a program that will predict secondary structures based on the primary uh, sequence of the RNA. And here we were able to show that the normal RNA had this kind of a sequence, particularly in this part of the molecule, and the mutant had just sort of a straight molecular structure as opposed to a branch molecular structure. And we believe that this this kind of a structure is important in binding to certain kinds of proteins, which may be important in the induction process. We also did some other experiments in which we did gel shift assay between normal and mutant RNA. And what we found was that A and C are the RNA probes only. But if we look at B, here's normal RNA, the normal MIR, plus the proteins that were extracted from normal hearts. And you see that there was binding present here. And if we took the mutant RNA and protein, you did not see the same kind of a binding pattern in the mutant RNA as with the normal. And we found this both in normal and mutant hearts, but the mutant RNA was not able to bind with those proteins in either case. We also wanted to show whether the MIR RNA is essential for normal heart myofibrillogenesis, normal heart development. This is a normal heart with no RNA, and, and as you can see, the tropomyosin is stained uh, significantly. Here's normal heart in which we have tied up the normal RNA using a double-stranded RNA, so we call it DS RNA, and it ties up the RNA and breaks it down so that it can't function, and in that case, we did not get normal heart development. Here's a mutant heart with no RNA, and what you would see. So the normal with the DS RNA, where the MIR had been basically destroyed, was fairly similar to the mutant heart with no RNA. These are simply lower magnifications and, and controls that confirm uh, what I just mentioned here. We also wanted to see if other vertebrates had RNAs which could promote the formation of cardiac muscle cells from non-muscle cells. And to begin with, we used the mutant axolotl hearts as our bioassay. We took human RNA that we were able to purchase commercially, and we made 400 clones from that human RNA, and we selected clones, tested them, and we found actually three clones that were active. And so uh, this is one of those clones that I'll talk about. They all show similar results. But if we treat the axolotl hearts for varying time periods, here's the mutant axolotl heart at day zero. And this shows the tropomyosin day one, day two, day three, day four, and day five. You can see that there's a progressive differentiation of that cardiac muscle structure, those cardiac myofibrils. Here's the uh, control, mutant control with no RNA. And here is a, a normal control. This is a normal heart. This is a mutant heart that's been treated with the human MIR, and this shows, after days of treatment, the approximate level of fluorescence in each of these hearts. And by uh, the fifth day, the mutant heart has about 90% of the amount of fluorescence that's present in the normal. And if you let it go further, it will have an even higher percent. We also wanted to test, and this, this happens to be one of the other clones of human RNA, and we wanted to test whether we could take this RNA, this myofibril-inducing RNA, and we could take stem cells that were being cultured, these are mouse stem cells, and treat them and see if this would increase the number of mouse cells that would be formed into cardiac muscle tissue in culture. This is now a simple tissue culture, and these cells are mouse stem cells, and they've been treated now with this particular clone, MIR-499. And after eight days, you can see that a high percentage of these cells had turned into cardiac muscle cells, as indicated by the expression of cardiac troponin T, a cardiac-specific protein. At least 80% uh, at day eight had formed into cells that were expressing cardiac-specific troponin T compared to about... 20% of the untreated cells. So clearly, cardiac inducing MIR, it is basically able to induce the formation of cardiac cells from 
stem cells as well. And if we look at higher magnification, this uh, again is that same clone. Here's one of the cells. This is uh, stained with cardiac troponin T. So it's a cardiac specific kind of protein that is lining up along what appear to be forming myofibrils in these characteristic spindle shaped muscle cells. And this happens to be alfactinin, which also shows the presence of uh, organized myofibrils in these cardiac stem cells in these stem cells that have formed into what appear to be cardiac cells. If we look at the secondary structures of these clones, uh, this one happens to be clone 6, you can see that they are very similar to that active RNA clone from the axolotl. Here's the axolotl clone, and if you look at this component part of it, you can see there are definitely some similarities between the two molecules which potentially could allow probably a binding to similar kinds of proteins. And with that, we, uh, we came up with some models. Initially, we thought that the tropomyosin deficiency, it might be a deficiency in messenger RNA. However, we found out that that was clearly not the case, that it was a, more an indirect case with some kind of inductive factor. And so that wasn't it. If we, we thought it might be something binding to the outside of the cell, like a lichen that would send a signal into the cell, However, and I didn't show you this information in the lecture, but we were able to show that without the RNA actually getting into the cell, and we did that by double labeling experiments, the RNA has to get into the cell in order for the myofibrils to form. And so we ruled that out as well. And we're left with a couple of alternatives at this point in terms of a mechanism. The active RNA may just come in as a regulatory RNA, one possibility going as a transcription factor to the nucleus, which will set up a cascade of events that leads to the formation of organized myofibrils. Another possibility is that that RNA would come in and bind to a protein, uh, which we think is certainly possible as well and do the same thing in terms of serving as a transcription factor leading the formation of organized sarcomeric myofibrils and therefore turning these non-muscle cells into cardiac muscle cells. With that, uh, we were able to conclude that, uh, well, we, we've now cloned the full length of the MIR RNA. I didn't illustrate that to you, but it's about a thousand nucleotides both the normal and mutant embryos express the MIR. We found that out. The mutant RNA is abnormal due to a point mutation that affects secondary structure. The point mutated RNA does not bind with proteins in the same way as normal. The MIR gene is essential for normal myofibrillogenesis and heart development. Higher mammals, including humans, have RNAs that are functionally homologous to the axolotl MIR and capable of promoting heart muscle differentiation. In addition, stem cells from mouse form cardiac-like cells in culture when treated with the MIR. What we have found is that, indeed, we believe we know what the mechanism is for this mutation not working in the axolotl. We think we've, it is an abnormal inductive process. And by taking advantage of abnormal inductive process, we have been able to discover a way to induce the formation of cardiac muscle from non-muscle cells. With that, I'd like to thank my collaborators over the years. This uh, is a summary of a number of years of work from Texas A&M University here in Commerce, from Florida Atlantic University, several colleagues and students, PhD students and master's students, from the State University of New York in Syracuse, University of Miami, Temple University in Philadelphia, and also Texas A&M University and College Station. Thank you.